Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. Have you ever watched a movie or read a book about time travel? Do you remember that lovely sensation of your synapses tying themselves in knots as you frustrate yourself wrapping your brain around concepts contradictory to all of your experiences? Well, the scary part about that is anyone researching it is going to feel the same way. Attempts to flout the rules of reality will do that. Tonight's story of scientific skullduggery, The Farnsworth Experiments, by James N. You may have heard of the Farnsworth experiments. My dad was one of the scientists involved. He rarely talked about it, and when he did, he always said that the rumors had been overplayed. The team tried and failed, nothing more to it. He seemed to get annoyed at me asking him about it. When I kept it up, he eventually told me a brief account of what had happened. It was in the mid-80s, and he was living in Albany, New York, pursuing his PhD. This was a year or two after I was born. He began work on a government-funded research project. The experiments were to be done under absolute secrecy. The goal was to test a 15-year-old hypothesis that, previous to this point, had been untestable. If it were true, then time travel was possible. They spent nearly a year working on the project, known only by its codename, Farnsworth. They tried and tried, but found nothing. Then the project ended. There were no deaths, no disappearances. There were no strange events around the region. The reason that the government denied the project's existence was purely embarrassment over funding something that in hindsight seemed so ridiculous. It felt good to know the truth. Whenever I heard someone retelling the story, I wished I could tell the real version, but I promised Dad that I wouldn't for the sake of his career. For the next few years, I didn't really think about it. It was one little story, among many, sitting in the back of my mind. Went off to college, lived life, and never gave it a second thought. A few months after I graduated, I drove up to Boston for Thanksgiving of 06. Dad still lived in the same house that we had lived in since I was maybe 10. Uh, Thanksgiving this year was smaller than years before. It was just me, Dad, and my older sister, Kate. It was a normal Thanksgiving meal. Peas were in short supply, but I never much liked them anyway. Looking around the table, I felt deja vu. We all sat in our usual chairs, clustered around the part of the table not covered in papers and screens filled with incomprehensible equations. It was nice to be back. Just when the meal was drawing to a close, there was a knock on the front door. I went to go open it. It was a man of maybe 60 years. He looked very worn out. His grayish hair was a mess. He was unshaven. My dad came over and said, Bill, what are you doing here? The man walked in and shut the door behind him. Dad looked over to us and said, This is Bill Benson an old colleague of mine. Bill looked at me and Kate and then back at my dad. John, is there somewhere we can talk privately? In my office. Uh, are you okay? I don't know. They walked away quickly. Kate and I waited for them to come back, very curious about what was going on. She seemed to remember him just barely from back in Albany. She must have been around four or five at the time. We kept looking down the hall to Dad's office, but the door remained shut. No words were possible to make out, and after what felt like half an hour, Kate said, I have an idea. She led me upstairs to her old bedroom, situated right above Dad's office. She motioned for me to be quiet and pointed to a vent in the corner of the room. From it, we could hear the muffled conversation. Uh, they were speaking in various kinds of jargon. I heard a lot about oscillations. Um, after maybe two to three minutes, I heard Bill shout, You can't hide! You have to face the truth! My dad replied, sounding more nervous than I'd ever heard him. I don't know why you went back. 
I got up from the floor quickly, hitting my head on the shelf with a loud thud. I heard the conversation stop. As me and Kate walked as quietly out of the room as we could, we heard footsteps downstairs. And as we descended the old wooden flight of stairs, Dad walked into view. How much did you hear? He asked. I replied, we were there for maybe five minutes. He told us to sit down at the table. We went back to the dining room. Bill sat there too, taking some old notebooks off the seat of his chair and putting them on top of the cluttered side of the table. Dad took a deep breath and started to speak. Kate, Robert, I have some things I need to explain. He seemed to be very shaken up, but he was pushing through it to the best of his ability. You know how I've said I worked on the Farnsworth experiments when you were both really little? Well, when I told you that we failed, that was a lie. It worked better than anyone could have expected. But there was a problem, a big problem, and now we don't talk about it. We think about it as little as we can, and we never go back. That's why we moved away from Albany. Now, Bill's problem is he went back. He shouldn't have. We can't get ourselves involved in it again. He looked at me and my sister. For your own good, please don't try any detective work. Live as I live. Live like none of it ever happened. Those of us who ignore the past are fine. Now, we're going to eat dessert like nothing happened, and we're going to forget, okay? I nodded, though my head was filling with questions. Bill looked over at Dad and said, I can't just leave it like this. I tried for years. We have to find the ones they took. Emily might be out there. Don't you want to find her? Dad said, My wife is dead. She died in a car accident. Bill started to speak, but Dad cut him off. If you want to stay for dessert, stay. But try to dredge things up that are meant to be forgotten, then you're not welcome in my house. I had never seen Dad act like this before. Bill looked at him and said, I'm sorry, John. He got up, walked through the adjoining living room, and out the door into the light snow. Dad took a deep breath and didn't speak for maybe a minute. Then he said, I'm sorry you had to see that, but it's nothing to worry about. I'll get out the pumpkin pie. And then we ate in silence. A few weeks later, after I'd gotten over the shock of that night, I did some research on Bill Benson. At first, I couldn't find anything referencing from within the past 10 years. I found an old web page for a university that listed a William C. Benson as a professor. The photo was definitely him. I ran the photo of him through face recognition and found two matches. The first was old. In it were five people, some in lab coats. Benson was on the left looking much younger. His hair was neat. He was wearing street clothes, also neat. And on the right were two women that I didn't recognize. They were the oldest of the group. In the middle were my parents. Dad, who looked nearly the same as after all those years, and Mom, who I only remember from pictures. Above them was a banner saying, Happy New Year, 85. The photo was taken a few months after I was born. I saved it, then opened the second match. This picture of Benson must have been far more recent. He looked like he had on Thanksgiving, but older. His hair was grayer and longer. The photo had been taken in the dark with a flash, making the background hard to make out. The thing that struck me most about that picture was the look of absolute terror on his face. I closed the photo quickly and saved that too. I then noticed that they came from the same source. It was a blog with the two photos as the only posts. There were no dates posted on either. Whoever made the blog must have disabled them from showing. As the weeks and months went by, I tried to forget all of this had happened. Whenever I did think about it, I found myself 
filled with an equal mix of fear and curiosity. Forgetting over time became easier. I got a job in Tampa, Florida, and I was in and out of two relationships. Kate was living in New Jersey, working on her residency at a big hospital. We never talked about it. I assumed she was trying to forget, too. Dad never said anything about it. He was completely normal. I took up photography as a hobby, and I was getting pretty good at it. Four years after I met Benson, the family got together for Thanksgiving again. I flew up from Florida to participate. This time, there were more people. My aunt and uncle, a cousin, and Kate's fiancé all showed up. It felt strange entering that house. The memories flooded back to me. I was the last to arrive. The large dining room table was cleared of the clutter that had filled much of it in the past, and I realized that I was later than I thought, as Thanksgiving dinner was nearly underway. I sat on the last untaken chair, the same chair Mr. Benson had sat on, and any anxiety that I felt began to fade after a few minutes. It was nice. I was with family. Dad was chatting about the goings-on at MIT, his research, who was getting tenure, the usual things. I occasionally thought I heard some nervousness in his voice, but it was too subtle to really feel. We ate pumpkin pie again, and the next day I returned to Florida. Two months later, I got a call from Kate. Dad had disappeared. He hadn't been coming to work, he wasn't at his house, his car was in his driveway, and there was a search for him. I flew out immediately. They combed the area. They scoured databases, but even with his name, face, thumbprint, and retina, they found nothing. After a month, they stopped looking altogether. He was presumed dead. I wanted to tell the police everything I knew, but they wouldn't have believed me. Calling the Farnsworth experiments into it would be like blaming his disappearance on a UFO or Bigfoot. I did tell them about Benson. I said that if he was alive and anyone knew where he was, Bill Benson would. I told them that he was a professor at a local college around 15 years ago, but I didn't remember which one. They quickly found it, Bridgewater State University. He taught physics and math there for 10 years before resigning. It was clear that he hadn't had any professorships after that. He had completely dropped off of everyone's radar. The one piece of information that they could find about him was an apartment that he had rented five years ago. It was in Albany, New York. They couldn't get any other information. To them, Bill Benson was a dead end. I knew Dad was alive. He must have decided to go back, just like Bill. I had to find my dad and try and pull him out of whatever he was putting himself into. On February 16th, I decided to find Mr. Benson myself. In early morning, I packed up my luggage and checked out of my Boston hotel. I scraped the ice off of the windshield of my rental car and set off towards Albany. I didn't tell anyone where I was going. The drive was a little under three hours. When I got there, I checked into another hotel, used a fake name. I don't know why I did it, I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Later, I made my way to his old apartment, bringing my camera with me. After a short drive, I found the building. I parked and walked in. I made my way to the main office and then walked in there. Can I help you? said the woman behind the desk. Yes. Uh, can I ask you a few questions about someone who used to live here? Is it about William Benson? She replied. Yes, it is. I already told the police everything. I don't know where he went when he moved out. Are you a detective? No. I'm John Bowen's son. She nodded and said, You could talk to his old next-door neighbors. He lived in apartment 108, and the people in 107 still live there. I hope they find your father. I thanked her and left. After a quick look around, I realized that the 100 level apartments were in the basement. I walked down a short flight of stairs and into a long hallway. 107 was easy to find. I knocked on the door. 
The residents were a couple in their early 30s, a man and a woman named Kimberly and Al. I talked to them for a few minutes. They saw Benson as a bit of a nut. They barely talked to him besides greetings in the hallway, and as I was about to leave, Kimberly seemed to remember something and told me to wait. She ran into the apartment and came out a minute later with a small, taped shut cardboard box. He told us that if anyone trustworthy came looking for him, to give them this, she said. I thanked them both and returned to my car, ripping through the tape with a key. In it was a ridiculously old looking cell phone, a photograph, and a few pieces of paper. I looked at the photograph first. I knew that photo. It was the New Year's Day photo, the exact same photo that I had seen on the internet four years previously. Memories came flooding back. I thought of the day Mr. Benson came to the Thanksgiving dinner and what he had said. I took a deep breath and looked over the papers, sheet after sheet of random notes and equations. Then I flipped open the cell phone and it turned on. I opened the list of contacts and only one was listed. It was the cell phone number under the name Call. I did. It rang once, twice, three times, and then I heard a voice. Who is this? said the phone. It's Robert Bowen, I replied. Good. Meet me in half an hour in Washington Park. I'll be by the fountain and the call cut off. I knew it was Bill. I remembered his voice clearly. I put the contents of the box in my camera bag and then made my way by foot to the park. After a bit of walking, I saw a fountain in the distance. A light snow was falling. As I got closer to the fountain, I realized that it had been turned off, presumably for winter. I brushed the snow off a bench and sat down waiting. After about ten minutes, I saw someone walking towards me out of the storm. It was him. Bill sat down next to me. He looked older than when I had last seen him. His hair was completely gray. It looked like he hadn't cut it for a while. And he finally said, Someone came. Have you seen my dad? I asked. He replied, No. I'm trying to find him, though. What happened to him? Where is he? Bill paused for a long time and then said, I don't want to get you involved. I'm sorry I brought you into this and I'm sorry I brought John back into it. He was the only one of us who made a clean break. What happened with these experiments? What, what is it that everybody's been trying to hide from me my entire life? Kid, it's for your own good that I don't tell you. You still have the photograph from the box? I pulled the picture out. Bill took it and pointed to the woman on the far right. Disappeared. Insane. Disappeared. Disappeared. Oh, and then there's me. I'm trying to find these people, not send more off. And with that, he left, walking away without even another word. I snapped a picture of him as he disappeared over a hill. I looked to the ground and saw his footprints in the snow. I started following him before they were filled in. It felt like I'd been following those footprints for an hour. They just kept going. Faint, but not quite filled in. I finally stopped to catch my breath. I was thinking Bill must be keeping in great shape. He in his 60s was easily outpacing me, a 26-year-old. Then a more unnerving thought came to mind. Washington Park was less than a half square mile, but I wasn't going in circles, was I? I also hadn't seen the road in a long time. I began to look around. I was in the middle of a snowy wilderness. I had just been in a city. How could I be here? The snow was starting to get pretty light. I, I pulled out my cell phone. No reception. Bill's cell phone. No reception. I looked at the footprints. They were almost gone now, but not 
quite. I kept going for maybe 20 more minutes until I found where they were going to. They stopped at an old building made of sheet metal, apparently. It looked to be two stories tall. It had one window and one door. That building gave me the creeps. I pulled out my camera and snapped a picture of it. I walked to the perimeter, but I saw no other ways in. Ah, my head hurt like crazy. It was dark. Night. What the fuck just happened? Night? I was lying in the snow. I, I tried to think back. The last thing I could remember was the strange building. I took out my phone and looked at the time. 2.28 a.m. I used the glow of my phone as a flashlight, illuminating only a few feet in front of me. The only thought in my head was to get the fuck out of here. But I didn't know how to get back. I was shivering. I touched my head, feeling a sharp pain. I shined the phone light on my hand and saw blood. Then I decided to just start walking. I couldn't stay in one place. Every time I stopped, I felt like I was being watched. Eventually, I saw a light in the distance and I felt a tremendous feeling of relief. Huh, civilization. As I grew closer, the light grew brighter, but only one light. It certainly wasn't downtown Albany. Maybe it was a farmhouse, somewhere warm and safe. I began to run, cell phone outstretched, and I felt a sinking feeling as the source of the light grew more and more apparent. It was the sheet metal building. The light was coming from one of the windows and then it turned off. The only light was coming from my cell phone. The woods were completely still. I was frozen in place. I didn't want to make a sound. The one door began to open, and I heard a familiar voice. It was Bill. Robert, is that you? Said Bill as he stepped outside. I felt relieved. Get inside before you freeze to death. I walked in and followed Bill. It was warm inside. The room was large and devoid of any furnishings, but there were two flights of stairs, one going up, one down. What is this place? I asked. This was our home base back in the 80s. This is where the experiments happened? Yeah, exactly, said Bill. Our lab was downstairs. Everything down there has been broken for a long time, though. How did I get here from the middle of a city, I asked. It would take me days to explain. Just think of it as a result of the experiments. Somebody knocked me out, Bill. How do you know we're not in danger? I'm sure it was a tree branch. The place has been calm for years. We're safe. I was beginning to settle down slightly. I'm gonna go get some coffee. Would you like some? Yeah. Sure, I said. He walked over to the flight of stairs that led up. After a minute or two, I walked over to those stairs, and I could see him boiling some water on a wood-burning stove. I walked over to the other staircase and shined my phone light down, revealing an old wooden staircase. I flicked a light switch, causing the room to fill with light. It was a laboratory with many devices that I didn't know the purpose of. I nervously walked through it. On the other side of the lab was another door. I tried that one, opening it without resistance. I flicked another switch and saw another lab very similar to the first, but a little larger. I noticed a banner on the far wall. It was old and faded, but I could still make out what it said. Happy New Year, 85. I noticed on one table was an old notebook. I picked it up and opened it. It was uh, lab notes of some sort, and I began to read. A lot of it I didn't understand, but one section was relatively clear. It was a series of journal entries by one of the scientists. Now, I don't still have the notes, but I'll try my best to summarize what I read. Early entries are calm and optimistic, lots of technical stuff. They ate pizza one night. Then. There are the next few entries, more spaced out. 
they're mostly talking about an issue with something they call oscillators. The tone is wearier. Then there's a three month gap. The next entry was the last one, and I remember it clearly, word for word. It said, we're being watched. I know it. I hate that hole. I didn't know what it exactly meant, but all of my nerve seemed to leave right then. I wanted to go back upstairs, but first, I'd take some pictures of the journal. It would only take a second. I took the camera out of my camera bag and turned it on. On the screen were flashing words out of memory. That was strange. To fill my memory card up, you would need a ridiculous number of photos. It was barely 7% full when I had last looked. When did I last use the camera? And how had I used it that much? Before I blacked out. I, I remember that. Then I heard faint footsteps from far away. Got the coffee! Bill shouted. Be there in a minute! I shouted back. My mind was now focused on this new, peculiar problem, and I began to scroll through my photos. Each picture had a number, the date it was taken, and its size on the screen around it. There was a picture of Bill's old apartment building. There was Bill running over the hill. There was the metal building. Uh, there it was again. And again. How many pictures of it had I taken? I must not have blacked out. I lost a portion of my memory. I kept clicking through the pictures. I must have been taking them like mad. In, in the pictures, I walked back into the woods. There were ten or twenty of snow and trees. Then one of a man, I think it was Bill, he looked mad, and I couldn't remember any of this. I'm, I'm guessing that he was mad that I had followed him. He calmed down in the next few pictures. We then showed up back at the metal building. I had no idea why we went back. Uh, Bill opened the door, and we went in. Coffee's getting cold! I'm almost done here! The next few pictures were of the ground floor of the metal building, but it was filled with furniture. All of it looked like it had been falling apart for a long time. Where had it all gone? I felt a chill run up my spine. The next few photos were of that first lab. I must have been trying to document every machine that was in there. Finally, I got to a photo of where Bill was reaching for the door to the second lab, the room I'm in now. I must have gone through the same routine again, photographing everything. There was the banner, there were the lab notes, then one photo showed up that confused me. It was of another door, one that I didn't see anywhere in the room. The file size on the photo was 15.3 gigabytes. Are you coming? Don't stay down there too long. The file sizes were expanding with each image. The next was a look at the door from farther away, then one of Bill opening the door, obviously straining himself. The screen on my camera labeled this photo as the fourth from the last, three more. I pushed the button to see it next. It was Bill. He looked terrified, and then it hit me. This was the same photo that I had seen online four years ago. The background was too dark to make out what was in the third room. Whatever it was had to be horrible. I could see it in his eyes. Look, I'll just bring the coffee down to you then, Bill shouted calmly from two rooms away. How could he be so calm after what he'd seen? How could he say everything was safe? My fingers shook, but I, I managed to move on to the next picture. It was a hole, going way deep down. The instant the light from the photo hit my eyes, I felt a horrible feeling. I knew something was out there, watching me. I felt it. I felt it watching from every angle. I quickly pushed the button. I couldn't stand looking at that picture for another second. The camera started loading the last picture, and what flashed onto the screen shocked me more than anything in my life. 
Bill's dead body, lying next to the hole. He was covered from head to toe in scratches and cuts and wounds. A pool of blood had formed around him, dripping down into the hole. The same expression from the previous photo had locked on his pale, dead face. I almost threw up. I pulled the batteries out of the camera. I felt too weak to move. And then another thought came to mind. If William Benson was dead, who was it that I'd been talking to the last few hours? Who was it whose footsteps were coming down from the second lab? I felt the watching return. There was nowhere that I could hide. I, I, I heard the footsteps grow louder. Uh, Bill, whatever that thing was impersonating him, was standing in the doorway. And I could see through the disguise. The form that I once saw as Bill was composed of gray wisps and tendrils, somehow forming one creature. Now I could see what was watching me. More and more of them became clear. They moved in on me from all directions. They seemed to form themselves into millions of arms, each reaching to grab me. I struggled with all my might, but I was helpless. They felt cold and horrible. Then they started to pull me across the room. I managed to get one glimpse of where they were pulling me, an open door that I hadn't seen before. They were pulling me towards that hole. I, I struggled as they dragged me through the small doorway past Bill's body closer and closer. Then they stopped. I don't know how long I was held there. All I know is that eventually I passed out from exhaustion. I woke up in a field. I was alive, somehow. I still felt watched, but I was alive. Today, I'm back to living my life the best I can. They spared me. I don't know why. Now I'm under a sort of house arrest, if you will. I'm somewhere where I can't make trouble. I've been here three years. It's now 2013. I have a job, an apartment, and they're always there in the corner of my eye, watching me every day. I haven't told anyone. I don't know why they do different things to different people. Some they watch, some they kill, and to some they do much worse. I've now concluded that the Farnsworth experiment sought to find a means of time travel by drilling through another reality, but nobody had considered what inhabitants that reality might have. I'll end with a brief statement to the people who were there in my old life. My name is Robert Lawrence Bowen. I was born in the year 2084. I'm 29 years old. Dad, if you're reading this, take your own advice. Kate, don't try to come for me. That also goes for everyone back in Florida. By the time any of you read this, I'll be dead. Don't try to save me. Don't try to change the past. They won't let you. The Farnsworth experiments have had many victims. Don't let yourself become another. Huh. Odd. If you've ever watched Doctor Who, that one kind of reminds me of the Weeping Angels. Neither makes much sense. Both make lots of corpses. Stay scary, wildlings. When that creepy old man advises you about something that could save your life, listen! Oh, and um, make the most of your nights. <laughs>